Hello, and thank you for joining us on MedEd Talks. You're listening to the podcast series, RSV Immunoprophylaxis, an Obstetrician's Guide to Enhancing Comprehension and Counseling. This continuing education activity is provided by Vindico Medical Education and supported by an educational grant from Sanofi. For program details, including how to claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joseph Domikowski. Hello, I'm Dr. Joe Domikowski, professor of pediatrics and professor of microbiology and immunology in the Department of Pediatrics at SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. Joining me is my colleague, Dr. Kevin Alt, professor in the Division of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Western Michigan University, Homer Stryker School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Alt. Thank you. Today, we are going to discuss clinical decision-making for infant RSV immunoprophylaxis. Uh, I thought maybe we'd be best to start with maternal health factors. So, well, Dr. Alt, what maternal health factors should influence whether an obstetrician recommends maternal vaccination versus infant immunoprophylaxis? Well, we do have a recommendation to do one or the other. And so the biggest pregnancy factor that we'd think about for maternal immunization would be gestational age. We want to give it between 32 and 07 weeks and right up to 37 weeks. I know not everybody thinks like an obstetrician, but there's a window there to give it so that that gives the mother enough time to make an immune response. The antibodies cross the placenta and the newborn has a full complement of maternal antibodies. And we, it's September 1st to January 31st are the timing that we give it as far as the season, the respiratory season. So there's there's one vaccine that's recommended. There are several that we give to adults, but there's only one we give during pregnancy. The others are not indicated during pregnancy. There's a lot of other nuance we could probably talk about with these vaccines. And I, and I think ACOG's guidelines get into this a little bit. Um, you, you know, you're dependent on placental transfer. So if you're worried about the health of the placenta, then you probably should go with newborn immunoprophylaxis. I'm I'm speculating a little bit. I don't know that we have great data to back up what I'm saying. But since you have choices, you know, that might be a little of the art of obstetrics is recommending that. Um There are two other points that have come up about safety signals. The original clinical trial showed a uh, increased rate of preterm delivery, although it did not reach statistical significance. There's been two or three trials uh, since then that have not shown an increased risk of preterm delivery. There's been a minor increase in uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in several studies. It's low enough that it's probably confounding, and I can definitely see other obstetricians, midwives, and family doctors saying, you know, you might deliver early because you have risk factors for hypertension, so we're going to give you the vaccine to make sure you have it on board. And so it's, you know, a selection bias to some extent. So, but those are the main things that I think about when I think about making these choices from one to the other. And yeah, so maybe we can turn next to after the pregnancy about infant newborn characteristics, um, which of these might play roles in guiding immunoprophylaxis decisions beyond maternal vaccination? Well, that's, uh, you know, something that falls under your specialty more than my specialty. But, you know, the the recommendation is really universal prophylaxis. Polizumab is going away. Now we have two new monoclonal antibodies the past two or three seasons that we're using that we're giving all newborns. They're certainly... um, I'm the father of a premature daughter, so I'm familiar with at least one of the risk factors of prematurity, but there are congenital heart disease and some other things that we worry about. But about 80% of newborns that get hospitalized in the first few months of life do not have a risk factor. And so we're going to prophylax everybody since we have these long-acting, less expensive antibody choices available. Great. Um, You mentioned ACOG. Um, What are the latest guidelines from ACOG? And um, AAP, I know they're they're pretty much aligned with one another. Um, but when we talk about maternal vaccination and infant immunoprophylaxis, what, what are they guiding us to do? Both organizations have updated their uh, recommendations fairly recently, and both documents are very thorough. And I certainly refer people for a deeper dive to look at those documents. 
uh, Klezrovimab got approved for this season as far as an immunoprophylaxis. So that's the second uh, one that we have available. And so we were, you know, we had to update our documentation. Both groups had to update their documentation to take into account for this. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think that they both recommend you do something. And I think both groups emphasize is you make sure immunoprophylaxis is available in your birthing hospital or in the practice or at the federally qualified health center that your patients are going to follow up in, you, you, you know, there might be some gaps in coverage and hopefully having a second monoclonal antibody on, on top of the servimab that was already available uh, will help with those gaps in coverage as far as postpartum and post-delivery uh, options for newborns. So and I, I think both groups emphasize that and hopefully that situation will be better than it was the first first season that we had these choices available. Yeah, agreed completely. Um, what can you um, tell us about the time of year and the seasonality of RSV and how it's predictably unpredictable uh, about decisions for maternal vaccination, infant prophylaxis, or instances where we might want to follow one with the other? This is something I didn't really think about as we were getting... Uh, as we started this, and after a couple of seasons, it became a little more relevant. So, you know, we have these shoulder seasons, you, you know, you can predict, to some extent, you, you know, the seasonality of RSV, but we have these shoulder seasons. And so we're only giving the maternal immunization from September 1st to January 31st. But in some jurisdictions, there may be an earlier start to the season and a later ending. And you know, America is a big country with a lot of different geographies. And certainly in the South, we see these prolonged seasons. Uh, you know, we're also making recommendations for Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Pacific Islands. And so you have to pay attention to some extent to your local data. And I don't know that any local jurisdictions have pulled the trigger on this yet, but you could see a situation where you'd say, Let's give an monoclonal antibody to newborns beyond what the usual season is. You can see a state or a county health department saying that. And that's one of the nice things I think about the immunoprophylaxis and the antibodies is there's a little more flexibility if there's a, an early season or a late season. So those shoulder seasons, I think, lend themselves a little bit more to, to monoclonal antibodies and maternal immunization. Hey, no, that's a really good point. I was noticing our regional epidemiology in central New York, around Syracuse, where I am, and comparing it with the epidemiology in and around New York City. And in some seasons, not related to the COVID pandemic, but pre-COVID, and now as we move toward more um, traditional epidemiology again, uh, I've noticed that there might be even a six-week difference between the onset of RSV uh, season to season between upstate New York and New York City. And so it really is important to pay attention to the local epidemiology, especially when you're deciding on the um, when to, to start this seasonal uh, immunization or vaccination. And ACOG and AAP are making recommendations kind of from the 35,000 foot level, but, you know, as far as local availability product and local seasonality, you really got to be in touch with your local public health officials. That's not something that OBGYNs do very well, I should say, since I'm the OBGYN on our two-person panel. You know, we need to probably pay a little more attention to that. Great. Um, I'm curious, um, practicing as an obstetrician, when do you start talking to pregnant women um, about RSV vaccine and uh, RSV immunoprophylaxis um, related to when they appear for, for their routine uh, obstetrical care. Yeah, we're recording this right at the beginning of respiratory season. So this time of year is a little tricky because we're trying to get people to get their flu shots, their COVID vaccines, their pertussis Tdap booster plus RSV. So we've got four things on the docket. Of course, you can get flu when it's available according to its seasonality. You can get uh, any time during your pregnancy, you get a COVID vaccine before you're pregnant. Or, or during your pregnancy. So, uh, you know, so those are less timed around the season, but we're trying to fit in all these vaccines at various points. Tdap is a little earlier 
than uh, what we give RSV. We usually give uh, Tdap around 27, 28 weeks. So we we can give it later, but to you know kind of space out vaccines during pregnancy, you can certainly do that. We can also give more than one vaccine at the same visit. We need to think about this more from patient acceptance viewpoint and maybe do some uh, qualitative research where we talk to patients and pregnant people about how they feel about all these vaccines. Because we haven't until recently had four vaccines in a pregnancy schedule that we've recommended. And, and I, you know, people will ask which one's more important than the other. Well, they're all pretty important, you know, COVID and Flu protect maternal health and Tdap and and RSV protect newborns. Even though doctors think it's a good idea, it's all about you know getting the vaccine in the arms. And so we need to ask pregnant people what they think about the the schedule that we have now. Yeah, very good. And, and the um, RSV vaccination um, is, I, I think, unique among the four that you talked about. In that, if um, during pregnancy the vaccine is missed or declined for whatever reason. We still have the opportunity and option to to give the extended half life monoclonal antibody to the baby um, at birth if they're born during RSV season. Yeah, one of the really interesting things about uh, the epidemiology of of all these four diseases we're talking about is that newborns up to the six months of age have about the same hospitalization rate as people in their sixties and seventies, especially for COVID but also for RSV. And so, you know, it's the classic U-shaped curve everybody probably saw in nursing, pharmacy, and medical school, you know, that uh, at the extremes of life, uh, elderly and newborn period, you're very susceptible to these four diseases, and especially RSV that we're talking about today. Yeah, that's great. And, and now we can do something about all four of them, uh, as long as we do what the recommendations are guiding us to do. Yeah, you know, I forgot a point on our very first question I should have brought up. And now that we're in the third season of doing this, this is going to become more important. There aren't data about repeat maternal immunization. If you had the vaccine in a prior pregnancy, immunoprophylaxis is probably a better choice just because we don't have safety data. There are some countries, and I know the UK and some South American countries are are doing that research, and there's probably stuff going on in the United States, too. And so we'll probably have an answer to that. But since we have choices now, uh, we should probably, people who are vaccinated in prior pregnancy and have a new pregnancy this season, the newborn should get immunoprophylaxis. The reason I thought about that is we give Tdap during every pregnancy, and we have data you know, about repeat doses of, of uh, Tdap in adults, including pregnant people. Yeah, very good point. So you started mentioning some of the issues around adapting our approach uh, with babies that are born earlier or later than expected in relation to the timing of maternal vaccination. Um, how should we look at this in certain circumstances, particularly um, maybe related to which baby should get uh, immunoprophylaxis even though mom was vaccinated? Right. So if it's less than two weeks, again, something we all learned in medical school, it takes two weeks to make antibodies. So if it's less than two weeks, there's not an adequate uh, maternal response to to go across the placenta. And so if it's less than two weeks, if the status is un maternal vaccine status is unknown, uh, that would be another reason to uh, give immunoprophylaxis to newborns, that really brings up the importance of documentation. Again, that's something where the OB team and the pediatric teams have to uh, be on the same page and exchange that information. Uh, so there's not any reason to give newborns both maternal immunization and immunoprophylaxis, except in those uh, limited circumstances that we just talked about. And you mentioned earlier um, about suspected or proven placental insufficiency. And, and in those circumstances, since it's not clear how much of the neutralizing antibody make it across in immunized or vaccinated moms, um, maybe those are circumstances where we should be careful to identify those babies and, and give them um, nirsevimab or klesrovimab. Right. I, I'm thinking we'll probably have data on that after a few more seasons, whether it's U.S. data or not. But, you know, we ought to be able to identify a risk group uh, of, uh, 
you know, growth restricted fetuses or, or other groups that probably should recommend immunoprophylaxis rather than maternal immunization. But, that, you know, that's mostly my opinion without data. Completely agree. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Alt, for this excellent discussion. And thanks to the audience for listening in. Please remember to take the post test and the evaluation to receive CE credit and to tune in for additional episodes within this podcast series. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us on MedEd Talks. To claim credit, please refer to the episode notes or the CE information. For other episodes in this series, search for RSV Immunoprophylaxis.